Good morning. My name is uh, Rich Keevy. I'm the uh, director of the Policy Research Institute for the region. And I would like to uh, welcome you here this morning to the Princeton campus on our subject of access to universal health care, New Jersey, the nation, and the globe. Before I get started, just a couple uh, housekeeping uh, guidance. Bathrooms you've probably found are on the left and right, men's over there, women's over there. We are not going to take a break. We're going to just move from panel to panel, so whenever you need to leave, feel free to do so. At the lunch break, uh, which will be around noon, lunch will be set up on either side, and uh, we would ask you to uh, get your lunch and come right back in as our luncheon speaker will speak from here uh, and you'll be out there in the audience. Uh, we've had a big subscription and for those who may have come late and there's no room, we do have an overflow room. But at the moment it looks like we all uh, can fit into the 190 bowl operation here. So thanks for coming. And at the outset, before I get going, I'd like to recognize our co-host in today's event, uh, Princeton's Department of Molecular Biology, and specifically Dan Notterman. And you'll hear from Dan in just a couple minutes. Universal health care, as you know, touches one of the deepest nerves that run through public policy on the state, on the national, and on the international arena. In recent years, uh, New Jersey has had significant activity in this area, sparked by an engaged citizenry, proactive advocates, various administrations, the legislature, and the private sector. Today, we have the good fortune to hear from perhaps the most informed participants in the ongoing dialogue here in New Jersey. Senator Joe Vitale, Health Commissioner Heather Howard, and Christine Stearns. For a comparative analysis, we in New Jersey only need to cast our eyes towards Massachusetts, which enacted its sweeping reform law in 2006. This initiative requires in Massachusetts nearly every resident of the Commonwealth to obtain coverage as it provides subsidized health care for residents earning up to 100 percent of federal poverty level and partially subsidizes health care for those earning up to 300 percent of the federal poverty level, depending upon an income-based sliding scale. The law is credited with covering an additional 440,000 Massachusetts residents, but it has stirred debate and attractive criticism, some of which you'll hear today from Nancy Turnbull, Brian Rossman, and Merrill Matthews. We also will extend our consideration this morning beyond individual states to the entire nation, where we see how the 2008 presidential election has shined a spotlight on America's inadequacy regarding the provision of health care. Over 15 percent of Americans had no public or private health insurance in 2007, totaling cl close to 46 million people. In exploring how the United States should approach this complex challenge, we will benefit from the insights of our luncheon speaker, Dr. Len Nichols of the New America Foundation. And finally, our examination of America's health care situation has prompted increased consideration of models from around the world. In fact, only a few weeks ago, the World Health Organization released a study that called for all countries to offer universal health care. The WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health composed of 19 independent experts, based this recommendation on a three-year study. And to guide us through the complicated, diverse landscape of global health systems, we have among the world's leading experts, Princeton's Uwe Reinhardt, Maggie Maurer of the Century Foundation, and Ezekiel Emanuel from the National Institutes of Health. I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to this forum since early summer. And I hope we'll enjoy our panel of experts that we have put together today. At this point, I'd like to invite up Dan Notterman to offer his thoughts on this uh, forum and also to introduce our first panel. Dan, please.
Good morning, friends. Permit me to add my welcome to Richard's and permit me to uh, compliment Rich and his whole team uh, over Cryer for putting on uh, not only a, a great conference today, but a series of three conferences uh, on the subject of health care. Uh, we began with uh, President Bill Owen, who just came in, president of UMDNJ. We have today's session, and later uh, you'll be hearing about, and I think you probably have, your, uh, an agenda for the final session of the fall in October on child health care in New Jersey and the region. So we in molecular biology are pleased to be able to join with Rich and Pryor to sponsor this conference. And we're delighted with the very obvious interest that our colleagues, our students, and the public have uh, in this topic. This display of interest makes me more hopeful than I've been, because as it stands now, it's easy to document, both through demographic analysis and every day in our state's children's hospitals and clinics, that many children in New Jersey fall ill, suffer, and even sometimes die because their parents are unable to afford health care. Even more pervasive, and perhaps more substantive, is the failure of our children to achieve their natural potential because they and their parents are unable to receive the routine anticipatory guidance and care that should be accorded to everyone who lives in our great nation. Our exceptional group of speakers today will point to different approaches to remedy this really intolerable state of affairs. This conversation is an essential one, and our fervent hope is that this conference will move even further the discussion on how to achieve a, a sound, how to achieve a sound and thorough basis for paying for and for receiving care. Well, I hope, because I'm a pediatrician, that it begins with mothers and children. The topic that we have specified for today's conference is universal health care. We believe that universal health care is the great unfinished business of our generation. We thank you for being here today to discuss it with us. So uh, I want to begin now with our first panel, which is going to focus on uh, what we're doing here in New Jersey to move forward with health care for all. And uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Senator Joseph Vitale. It's, fit it's fitting that we begin with Senator Vitale, represents the 19th Legislative District. Senator Vitale is Deputy Majority Leader of the New Jersey Senate, and he's also Chair of the Health, Human Services, and Senior Citizens Committee. He is a noted and prolific legislative advocate for women and for children and for health care. Senator Vitale is one of the moving forces in the recent New Jersey health insurance legislation. Uh, I can tell you on a personal note that the Senator has been good enough to come to one of the classes that I teach here at Princeton. And he's just a tremendous speaker. He empathizes with the students. And I think you'll be very pleased to hear what he has to say today. Senator? Good morning. Thank you, Dan. I did uh, uh, speak to his class of uh, students, and the course was the study of molecular biology. And no idea what that meant. I didn't even know what a molecule was until I attended the class and I got a great sweatshirt and had a great time with the students. Thank you. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces uh, here this morning, and uh, you've, many of you have participated in the discussion uh, in the halls of the State House and elsewhere. Uh, and, and so forgive me for repeating this for the 10,000th time and you're hearing it again. Uh, but for those who have not heard it, and to give an update for those who have participated in this process uh, over the past two plus years, I think it's necessary to first understand why it is that here in New Jersey we began this mission of trying to provide uh, universal health care, at least for the 1.3 million uninsured New Jerseyans. Uh, we recognized in the very beginning that you know, universal health care uh, means something to me and it may mean something else to you and to another. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, our mission, at least in the short term uh, and going forward now with phase two, is to offer 
uh, affordable health coverage and access to nearly 1.3 or now almost 1.4 million uninsured, you know, breaks down into really into three different groups. Uh, out of the, uh, the, the 0.3 represent the undocumented in New Jersey and also a growing number. The million break down into two groups and it's nearly 640,000 uh, who are not eligible for any state program, any federal program, not SGIP, not Medicaid, uh, who are the working uninsured uh, and the balance, uh, 300 and some thousand, are eligible for Medicaid or eligible for SCHIP, but are not yet enrolled. So we wanted to design you know, a program uh, and a policy as a state to really take the next step into trying to get everyone into coverage. And we know that all of you have experienced this, and I see some many hospital representatives here this morning, that the state's charity care system, the way it is that we provide care to the uninsured and the undocumented, the young and the old and children alike, uh, is inefficient. It's more than inefficient. It's very costly. Uh, we know that hospitals are in trouble, and mainly, but not only, but mainly because of the disproportionate share of uninsured uh, uh, they provide care for. Uh, and we know that uh, it's, we all wake up every morning uh, with coverage, and we know that we're lucky to have it if we pay attention to it. But imagine for those million plus people who wake up every morning and those who work for a living, who have a family, who have a home, who have assets, uh, worry uh, every day, God, I hope I don't get sick. Uh, God, I hope I don't lose my home, I lose my car, I lose my assets. Something really, really terrible falls on our family. We began this journey about two years ago. Dave Knowlton from the Healthcare Quality Institute, who is here today, and, and others, and my chief of staff, and, and Sarah and Lori, uh, put together a task force of, of experts from around the state uh, to really take the next step. And you know, back in 98, when we first started SCHIP and we expanded it for kids to 350 of poverty, and now parents at 200% of poverty, we knew that we had to do more. Uh, so we sat down and we said, what can we do in, in phases? You know, we're, this is just New Jersey. This is not national reform. And what can we do sort of in the context of what can we afford, uh, what's politically possible, uh, but moreover, in terms of policy, what's the right thing to do? And so really what's the right thing to do generally drove the discussion and drove the debate among all those who served on the task force. Uh, we had decided that uh, for all those uninsured, you know, the, the 700,000 or so who were not eligible for SCHIP or Medicaid, that they needed something. And for those who are eligible for SCHIP or Medicaid or not yet enrolled, what do we do about them? How do we get them enrolled? How do we get the quarter of a million kids in New Jersey who don't have uh, health insurance, most of whom are eligible for SCHIP, how do we get them into the system? And for all of you who understand that, you know, a healthy kid learns better, stays in school longer, uh, becomes a more productive adult, uh, and for adults who work for a living are more productive at work and just generally healthier, which is a good thing, uh, what can we do for them as well? So we decided that because of the, the, the difficulty with our, there was a chronic budget issues in New Jersey every year, that we'd have to do this incrementally, and we know that. Uh, and so we said, what can we do in the first piece? We know that the overall mission of our plan is to have an individual mandate in New Jersey, uh, that everyone must have health insurance. Of course, to get there, we also must make sure that we provide a product that's affordable. To say that you have to have something and you can't pay for it, well, that it's just an empty promise, it's a mandate, it just can't work. And so we decided that we would start this off in two phases. Phase one, which passed the legislature uh, overwhelmingly, unanimously in the Senate, uh, and nearly unanimously in the Assembly, Provided for requires really what is called what we call a kids first mandate that every child in New Jersey uh, over the next couple of years must have health insurance. Now it's non-punitive. Uh, we're not going to punish a family or a kid uh, for not having insurance, but it really says to the general population, to the parents of the kids, we want you in the system. We're working with hospitals. We're going to do a lot of outreach where it is that kids exist to get them enrolled. And really, for the first time, the state's going to have to take you know, measurable steps uh, to get these kids enrolled. The second piece of phase one is to, again, allow parents up to 200% of poverty, roughly $42,000 a year, into the SCHIP program. We used to enroll parents uh, several years ago, but it was frozen because of budget considerations. And now we've reopened the waiver, and we're allowing more parents now to come in. And of course, that's a great thing. And also, when you get more parents, you get more kids. Uh, and so we'll have more parents now enrolled in SCHIP and more kids enrolled as well over time. Phase two is going to be the most difficult. We thought phase one was difficult. Phase two is going to be extraordinarily more complicated, both not just politically, but in terms of the financing of it. Uh, but that is to get to the rest of the population, those 700,000, and a growing number of people who don't have health coverage. You know, health insurance is, by all accounts, at least in my world, you know, sort of these necessary evils. It exists. I can't change that 
today. I can't change it tomorrow. Uh, but it's, it serves at least, whether it's SCHIP or Medicaid or private insurance or what we hope to be a new state plan, it really serves as a gateway to care. And, and so it is that for you know, hundreds of thousands of New Jerseyans, of course millions of Americans, and not having access to dependable care uh, creates a whole host of issues. Let me talk about you know, chronic disease and uh, all of the other illnesses and, and bad things of, of, uh, befall people over time. Uh, a lot of it has to do not just with personal behavior, but also not having access to reliable, dependable care, the right pediatrician, the right family doc uh, for women, for women's services, and all whole host of things that people need uh, to conduct and produce a healthy life. When we started this process uh, nearly two years ago, it was just after we had done some other reforms in terms of SCHIP. Uh, we wanted to get more kids enrolled. We wanted to streamline the process. We used to have a 13-page application. It really looked like a tuition assistance application to Princeton. It was, you know, 13 or 14 pages. It almost required aerial photographs. It was this very cumbersome, complicated uh, document. And, you know, when we were hearing that we're having really low enrollment in family care, one of the first things we looked at was the application. It was just ridiculous. And it was so complicated. And when you made one mistake, it was put on the mistake pile. And, and maybe many months later, your application uh, would be looked at again. You might get contacted over the phone. So we went to a one-page application. We tried to make it easier. Hospitals are cooperating now, uh, enrolling kids into family care as newborns. Uh, of course, not getting paid through charity care for that as well. But you know, it also shows that the hospitals are now willing to step up and be partners in offering health insurance and offering, uh, doing their part actually to enroll more kids uh, and more uh, parents into the system. You know, it's not, it's not perfect, and if I had a magic wand, I would say that <clears throat> federal government, the state government, uh, some businesses, uh, consumers, we all have some skin in the game. You know, we'd all participate, and it would be a perfect world uh, that we could somehow do away with the extraordinary cost of, of administering insurance and streamline those costs and, and, and really produce and provide for you know, real savings. You know, we're the little state that could. And we looked at, we look at Massachusetts and some of the other states that are now experimenting uh, uh, on a statewide basis. And, you know, we wanted to do something that was unique for us. New Jersey is a very special place with very special needs. Uh, I don't know what the federal program is going to look like uh, come January. I can't predict who's going to win the race. Uh, I'm hoping that whomever it is, that uh, they're sensitive to the needs of states like New Jersey, where it's very expensive to be poor. We have a uh, high number of uninsured, where we have a lot of children uninsured, a high number of undocumented, uh, and we can find some relief and find some leadership and guidance and partnership with them. In the meantime, we have to do all that we can in a way that's smart, uh, that's efficient, uh, but in the end provides the kind of access to care that people deserve that they have a right to have. Uh, and so it's our mission over, which has been the past two years and now, God willing, not another two years, but uh, within the next year to take that next step. Uh, we have vetted our ideas with national experts. Uh, we've traveled around the country. We've taken our time. We didn't write a piece of legislation, sort of throw it together and say, let's have at it. Let's have this discussion. We took literally almost two years to write the document. First, to produce a white paper, uh, to talk to experts, uh, to meet with them, to listen to people that are not from New Jersey, so we're not talking to ourselves or to our friends, and to say, well, you know, is this a, a good start? Are we on the right track? Uh, what can we change to make it better? How can we pay for it? Uh, what does the benefit design look like? All the questions that were necessary to be asked and answered, I believe that we went through the right kind of process. Uh, and so it's not what I would consider to be perfect. A friend would say to me, don't apologize for what you're doing, and I'm not. Uh, I just know that as a state, we're going to struggle to do this. We have to do it. If we get national leadership on this issue and there's a partnership over time, that's a great thing. In the meantime, over a million New Jerseyans who don't have access to care, who suffer every day, uh, don't deserve this kind of treatment, and it's important for states like New Jersey to step up and try to do what they can and to improve the condition uh, of all of them, and, and God forbid, us someday if it happens to us. So I look forward to your questions and participating in this forum, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks. So our, our plan this morning is to uh, hold questions after individual speakers, the speakers will then uh, return to, uh, to the podium here, and we'll uh, organize this as a panel discussion with a Q&A um, after uh, we've heard from our three first speakers. Uh, the second person, uh, the second speaker this morning uh, is Christine Stearns, 
uh, who's an attorney with extensive political and legislative experience in New Jersey. Christine Stearns is a policy expert on health insurance and legal issues for the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. She staffs the Health Affairs Committee and the Legal Affairs Committee of that organization. She's played a very uh, important roles in politics and advocacy surrounding issues related to health care uh, and health care accessibility. In 2005, for this reason, uh, our governor, uh, John Corzine, asked her to co-chair the governor's health care and senior service policy group. Ms. Stearns, welcome to Princeton. Thank you so much for having me. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me. I'm often interestingly accused of not being loud enough. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. And you know, as the business community is, appreciates the opportunity to sort of be part of these discussions, sometimes we're not always viewed as a key stakeholder in some of the healthcare discussions, despite the fact that most people in New Jersey actually get their um, health coverage from their employer. Um, and for anybody who knows me in Trenton, I, I do spend quite a bit of time repeating pretty much the simple mantra that, you know, the cost of health insurance is a real concern for the business community. And um, I vary the sort of theme in the words that I use, but that is um, pretty much the key perspective that we have um, in the discussions about universal coverage. And it certainly isn't that I've talked to anyone in the business community, any of our members, who don't want to see everyone in New Jersey and in the country have access to health care coverage. Um, but rather, they have questions about how are we going to achieve that, you know, will, if it's a single um, payer government run system, will that really work better, be more efficient than the current system? Um, how are they going to end up paying? Because they sort of believe that one way or the other they're going to end up paying. Um, and so we try very hard to be part of the discussion to figure out um, that ensuring that that perspective is included. And, you know, and when I talk about sort of our members at BIA, we certainly have, I don't know, if, for those of you who are familiar with our organization, we have um, many of the, the largest companies here in New Jersey, but also of our 23,000 members, most of them are very small. So I get phone calls from, you know, a farmer in Monmouth County who has, you know, two employees who isn't really sure he can continue to afford his health insurance. And, they don't call me so much that there's anything that I really can do specifically to help them. I really think it's just for some sympathy and to tell them at least I'm trying to make it better for them. Um, but that's where our motivation to be part of the discussion really comes from. Um, you know, those farmers, the, the guy with the auto you know, repair shop who knows that if he asks his employees to have to pay any part of the premium, that there tend to be younger single guys that they have no interest in health insurance and he just thinks it's the right thing to do to make sure that they're covered. But, you know, what's he going to do as he's fortunate that his company is growing, but at the same time the health care costs are going up so much faster than any of his other revenue, how does he sort of make those numbers work? Um, and that's sort of what brings us to the table to be part of the discussion about universal coverage. Um, and so, Again, I guess the, the real issue with as New Jersey and the nation looks to pursue universal coverage is you know, the devil's in the details. How are we going to try to achieve that? Um, how are we going to ensure that we get more people covered um, at a reasonable cost? How much will it cost? Who's going to pay? And that maybe is the piece that we think is missing from some of the discussion um, around New Jersey's possible reforms, that there maybe isn't enough focus on cost containment and actually increasing quality at the same time. There's a pretty strong link there, so um, we're not having um, the discussion about improving the quality of the care that folks get, made, making sure that it is more efficient. Clearly we don't have all the answers and I think that that's one that really requires all the stakeholders to come to the table because there's no simple solutions. Um, but that is what we are really focused on, stabilizing costs and probably increasing the quality of the care. Um, and also making sure that as we're focused on getting that 15 percent of the state's population that don't have insurance covered, that we stay focused on keeping the other group insured. 
that um, as bad as it is, as it is for us to deal with the 1.234 million, whatever the sort of latest numbers are, um, how do we make sure that the other 5.5 million continue to have coverage? Because if they continue to lose coverage as premiums increase, our problem only gets harder to solve to get those folks covered. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is sort of wrap it up there because that's sort of the, the, the key message that we have from the business community. Unfortunately, I'm long on questions and sort of short on solutions. Um, and I wish that were different because I, I suspect that I'd be even more popular <laughs> if I had actual solutions. Um, but that uh, I'll save it for the questions for the audience and, and for the discussion later. But that is the sort of the key perspective, I think, of the business community that, that I have heard across the board, folks are sort of open to listening to all ideas, probably somewhat skeptical, skeptical of sort of government solutions as they typically would be expected to, um, but really feel that something just needs to happen. That if health insurance costs continue to increase at the same pace and we don't really see any significant change, they're very worried about the future and particularly the very short-term future of the ability to continue to sponsor health benefits for their employees, particularly those really small companies. So with that, thank you so much. Glad to be here. We're going to, do we need to get the volume up? Can people hear me a little better in the back now? OK, I see heads nodding. The, the final uh, speaker, uh, before we start our discussion and start taking questions in our first uh, panel, is the Honorable Heather Howard, Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. An attorney, Howard comes to the post, Commissioner Howard comes to the post with 15 years of policy experience at the state and federal level. She has expertise in areas of children and family issues, women's health, hospital and physician regulation, health programs for vulnerable populations, and efforts to expand health insurance coverage. I recently had the honor of serving on Commissioner Howard's task force on prenatal care, so I know firsthand of her commitment and her energy directed to the principle that all of our children and their mothers should benefit from sound and comprehensive care, beginning well, well before birth, beginning at the beginning. So it's really an honor for me, Commissioner, to welcome you to Princeton and look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to thank Princeton for hosting us. I was last here in January unveiling um, our report from the Commission on Rationalizing Healthcare Resources, which we now, everyone calls the Reinhardt Report. It's great to see you, Professor Reinhardt. So um, Princeton obviously has an international um, focus and scope. Um, but it's so great that you're um, playing such an important role as we're trying to solve our local problems. And, and, and Rich, there's nobody who knows those problems better than, than Rich uh, Keevy. And so it's exciting to have you here. And Dan has been a great resource. So, But uh, you haven't invited me to, to, to lecture on molecular biology. And I'm wondering when that invitation is going to come. Next week. <laughs> Um, I thought I would talk briefly about what we're doing in New Jersey. Senator Vitale gave you a good overview, and, and he was, of course, too modest. So I'll go through uh, about his role, and I'll go through some of that. And then, and then I wanted to outline some of the challenges we face going forward, because I hope that will set the table for questions, um, because I think we want to hear from you and want to learn from you all. Um, the good news is that we are really, I think, leading the nation um, in what we're doing on health care reform. We haven't made quite the splash, perhaps, that Massachusetts has or California has. But we have been quietly, under Senator Vitale's leadership, making a lot of progress. In fact, so much progress that we've been in a continual fight over the last couple of years with the Bush administration about the progress we've made. We've had to defend our very successful family care program for a number of reasons. One, they're critical that we cover so many people. We cover too high an income limit. As um, Senator Vitale said, it costs more to be poor in New Jersey, sadly. So we have, we have the highest uh, eligibility limit in the country for our family care program. It's not something we're ashamed of. Um, I think we all agree that 350 percent of poverty is not a family that is living comfortably and deserves uh, state support. So we've had to defend not only our income limit, we've had to defend the fact that we cover parents in the Children's Health Insurance Program. And we do so because the research is very clear that when you cover a parent, when you provide insurance to a parent, you're much more likely to get the child insured. 
So um, we've actually even recently, we've even over the past year had to sue the federal government as they've tried to limit our S-CHIP program and that um, the good news has been, I'm sure you all know the August, the famous August 17th directive from CMS that um, said you can't cover higher income kids unless you're, get, you're covering 95 plus percent of the lower income kids. They withdrew, or they've said they're not going to enforce that directive uh, for the time being, and I think we've bought enough time until the next administration, which hopefully will have a better view of that. So we've got the, a good um, groundwork to build upon. We've got a broad and aggressive family care program. We've got um, a very progressive leadership at the state level. Um, and then just this summer, summer uh, Governor Corzine signed into law phase one of the Vitali plan, which now means we're going to have universal access to coverage for children. Um, we, we're going to combine our high um, family care program with high eligibility with our family care buy-in program, which means that any family, regardless of their income, can buy into the state program at an affordable rate. That's $137 a month, which is a lot cheaper than what insurance would be out on the individual market. So we believe now that all children have access to affordable health care in New Jersey. Now our job is to make sure they sign up for it. And as Senator Vitale talked about, we need to make signing up for it easier. We need to do our job um, of getting out there and advertising the program. So look for, um, hopefully you guys will soon be inundated with TV ads about getting kids covered. That means we're doing our job. But unfortunately, although we've got this good groundwork of we've got um, the right political leadership, we've got strong public programs, we still got 1.3 million uninsured, about 300,000 of them who, are, who we believe are undocumented, although that number is the hardest to, to really quantify. Um, a significant portion are, are, are eligible but unenrolled, so we've got our work cut out for us uh, reaching out to them. Um, so that's why it was so exciting this summer when the governor, not only did he sign into law this child mandate, this universal access for children, we expanded family care for parents up to 200%. We also made some very sensible reforms to the private insurance market to hopefully make uh, insurance affordable for people who are buying insurance on the market. And, um, you know, we're going to be watching over the next year or so how that implementation goes. We, we believe that almost 60,000 parents will be eligible for this new expansion. So watch and see how we do. But one thing we do know is that expanding access to health care is a very sensible investment. Um, as Senator Vitale said, a lot of our friends from the hospital industry are here. We know that families rely on the ERs for primary care when they don't have health insurance. In 2002, when we had broader health coverage under our family care program before state budget problems um, forced the state to retrench, we saw charity care claims drop by almost $100 million. So there's a clear and direct correlation between health insurance coverage and the charity care burden that our hospitals are bearing. And we know that health insurance isn't just better for the system, it's better for people that once um, once people have health insurance, they have a medical home, which means they get access to preventive care. As Dan mentioned, he served on my task force on, pre on prenatal care, and we, we found that the number one indicator of whether women got access to prenatal care early in their pregnancy was whether they had health insurance. Ninety-six percent of women who have health insurance see a doctor in the first three months of her pregnancy. Only 73 percent of women go see a health care provider in the first, uh, first trimester if they don't have health insurance. So that was the number one indicator. It was as if we needed another reason to say we need universal health care. Um, you know, we didn't, but um, it was yet another reason. Um, I do believe, although New Jersey is making strides, and I like to think we're leading the country, uh, we need uh, a strong federal partner, and we haven't had that yet. And our hope, of course, is that um, with new leadership in Washington, we will. I'm sorry if I get a little partisan. Is that okay? <laughs> Those views are mine only. Um, and so we need, we need a strong federal partner. I have to say I've been disappointed that we haven't heard as much talk about health care reform as I would have liked recently in the debate, but I'm hoping as the debate heats up in the next two months we will hear more um, from the candidates about that. Now, then I thought I would quickly um, outline what I see as the challenges going forward. I think we know, and, and Senator Vitale and I have gone to enough conferences around the country, we know what the broad outlines are for reform at the state level. We know what works. We've seen what works in Massachusetts. We know that states need to expand public programs and leverage as much federal dollars as they can. We certainly are doing that in New Jersey. States need to look for sensible market reforms um, to bring down the cost of health insurance and, and probably some version of an, in, an individual mandate like we've seen in Massachusetts and we're looking at here in New Jersey. Those are the three main, um, the broad con contours of what state reform is going to look like. I think we know that, but of course the devil's in the details. 
And one of the problems we're facing is how do you create a political coalition for this kind of reform? The most fervent advocates are single-payer advocates. Um, and, and so you've got, um, it, it's hard to build a coalition of um, raging moderates, we like to call it. It's hard to do that. So um, how to get people together? Um, as Christine said, businesses are rightly concerned. They're, they're, um, the climate obviously is very tough for businesses generally, in New Jersey in particular. So they're worried about mandates and what that means for them. And I think the a point that we can't forget is that 85% of the people in New Jersey have health insurance. And so how do we convince the vast majority of people in New Jersey who have health insurance that lack of health insurance is their problem? Governor Schwarzenegger tried to do that in California with his uninsured tax, which made a lot of sense to me as a health policy wonk, but um, he ultimately didn't succeed. And there's a lot of theories on why he didn't succeed, but um, how do we convince the people who have health insurance that it matters to them? Uh, another challenge that we'll need to address, that we need to put out on the table and be open about, is the challenge of serving the undocumented. As Senator Vitale said, we have at least 300,000 undocumented in the state, and it's going to be impossible to reach them with any state-funded programs or federal-funded programs, at least as they're currently designed. Um, and so how, we're going to need, uh, we're going to need really out, outside the box thinking about that. Another challenge in New Jersey, particularly, is our fragile health care delivery system. And nobody knows this better than um, Professor Reinhardt. Um, we've got, uh, we, we obligate our hospitals to provide care to everyone who comes in, but we don't uh, reimburse them fully for it. Um, we have fragile uh, managed care networks. So we're, we, any reform plan we propose has to acknowledge and strengthen those, um, that delivery system that is so fragile. And finally, um, I think the most important lesson from Massachusetts is how do we make any reform plan sustainable? Massachusetts is, is a lot of things are going well up there, but um, they're, they're struggling with the cost of the program growing more than, faster than they predicted. So sustainability, as Christine mentioned, um, and cost containment. And also um, the simple things um, like how do you ensure access to providers? People have, everyone has, a, has an insurance card now, but they're not necessarily seeing doctors. So um, the good news is that we have folks in New Jersey who want to lead. We have some good examples to follow, and we have some lessons learned. But we have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. So, uh, so far this morning, we've heard um, three different perspectives about health care reform in New Jersey, or perhaps the narrow issue, issue of universal health care in New Jersey. We've heard the political legislative view from Senator Vitale, who has uh, led this effort over, over several years, and who I think is telling us that we're beginning to see the results of that effort. We've, uh, and, and interestingly from Senator Vitale, we heard a moral perspective that this is something that we need to do uh, for our children and for others in our state because we need to do it. It's just the right thing to do. From the business community, um, we also heard that um, this is needed, but we heard uh, perhaps the expected the skepticism about uh, the effects on the business community of, uh, of doing it and how can we implement this in a way that makes sense to our, our business people. And finally, from um, our Commissioner of Health and Senior Services, uh, we heard uh, many of uh, her ideas about how this will be implemented. We heard about some of the challenges, um, and, but we also, again, uh, heard uh, very strongly and clearly, I think, uh, the commitment of this administration to making sure that uh, all New Jerseyans uh, have the care they need. So I wanted to provide that sort of framework for what we've been talking about so far, and then open the panel uh, of distinguished leaders to questions and answers and uh, a discussion with the, with the audience. So I will turn this over to you now and the audience to, uh, to have a discussion. If you're going to ask a question, we ask you to use, use the mic. mics. Okay, I'd be happy, and Dale on the left would be happy to bring the mic up here so everyone can hear the question. Comments, I'll questions? Start off with one. Okay, otherwise I will, but go ahead, Rick. You go ahead, Rick. Folks in the room are probably aware that in New Jersey, um, smaller employers end up in the regulated health insurance market, and that's regulated by the state of New Jersey. So when we talk about market reforms, that's what we're talking about. Obviously, the state of New Jersey can't reach self-funded 
plans that are regulated under ERISA. Um, I think what we're talking about there is to try to examine why it is that those health insurance plans tend to be higher and actually tend to cover a little less than the plans for those large employers that are running ERISA plans. Um, so that the small employers who generally are less able and less likely to sponsor health benefits plans for their employees tend to be paying those higher premiums and that becomes a real problem. Um, and so whether the market reforms are looking at, we have a highly regulated health insurance market in the state of New Jersey. Um, it was all very well intentioned at the time, but um, the creation of the standard plans back in 1992 hasn't really been revisited in terms of what is part of those benefits packages and have they kept pace with um, today's reality of what really a good health benefits package would be? Is there a better way to do that? Um, are there ways to look at some of the regulations that are in place that may make it more difficult or more expensive um, to have the health plans in New Jersey? Um, some look at um, or compare it to what we did with auto insurance reform a few years ago where we really looked at the regulatory side of things versus the sort of benefits that, that people get when buying their auto insurance as a way to sort of make the market more attractive. Um, and those are some of the kinds of things in there. It, it's those technical who gets reimbursed for what, how. Um, you know, there's some unintended consequences in the small employer market for out of network providers may get paid charges, whereas if you're in network, you may get significantly less than charges. So there's some um, changes that we want to examine to make sure that we're really doing what's in the best interest of the sort of consumers and employers that are buying those plants. I think that's, that's exactly right, and I would only add a couple of concrete things that, that were looked at um, this summer were, one, increasing the medical loss ratio, so requiring insurance companies to pay out a greater percentage of the premiums in, um, towards providers or, 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 or hopefully to lower premiums as a result. So we increased the medical loss ratio to 80 percent, right? Another is changing our rating bands, uh, you know, is to try and make it um, – possible for insurance companies to offer cheaper plans to younger people to get more young people in. Of course, the, you know, the, the competing pressure there is that you don't want, um, um, you know, folks, um, seniors, AARP got very engaged in that debate, of course, was concerned about what the impact was going to be on seniors. So, but those are, those are two concrete things. Just on the, on the, uh, uh, the issue of uh, age rating, we change the individual market. The way it is now is pure, before the legislation passed, that we, we have pure community rating. Everyone would pay the same price, regardless of your age, regardless of your gender. Uh, but we changed that, and you know, part of the compromise in the legislative process was, you know, we also, like, just let me back up for one moment, during the process of trying to define reform and design reform, uh, we also recognized that we have to do something for the business community, for those who already provide insurance. We didn't want to see folks dropping out of coverage. We, we know that the business community just recently saw a report that there are less enrolled in New Jersey as around the nation uh, through business coverage or employer co sponsored coverage than in the previous two years. So I wanted to be really something to help at least sustain the coverage that they're already providing. I don't know that we had any magic bullet that would say, you know, magically that, you know, the costs are going to decrease so dramatically that more and more employers will jump into coverage. Uh, but I mean, in the individual market, uh, we designed, uh, as the Commissioner said, uh, you know, changing the uh, instituting age rating. And the compromise was that, uh, or, or the theory goes, is that if you charge younger people less, and older New Jerseyans pre-Medicare a little bit more, uh, that you'll incent young people to come into the, into the system. Uh, that's the theory. I don't know that that will work. Uh, I hope it does. Uh, but it's really meant to be sort of a bridge into the real reform, which is that all those who are currently in the individual market, the 80,000 or so, who are paying exorbitant prices, uh, most of them can't afford it, uh, will eventually come into a new system. Uh, just will it in because the cost in the new plan uh, will be less than they're currently paying in the individual market. Although some of them will pay full price, it'll still be less than what they're paying now. And those who can uh, qualify for a subsidy based on their income uh, will be eligible. So it really serves as a bridge. Let's try to get some younger people in because the price has gone down a little bit, maybe 10 percent, maybe 8 percent, maybe 5 percent. I don't know that's enough to get young people in because, you know, it's, as you know, and it's preached to the choir that, you know, if you're 23, 24, 25 years old, you don't have health insurance, you're not getting it through your employer. Even if it's offered, you don't take it because you're healthy. You're not worried about getting sick, you're not contemplating having a baby, uh, any number of things. Uh, but at least those who are already in it, we want to try to make it a little bit more affordable, maybe drive down the cost a little bit, make it affordable for those to come in. But again, the, the, the end game for us was to just to create some stabilization and create a bridge to 
the next step where it is that over time, those individuals, those 80,000, we could join up with the 700,000 New Jerseyans who are not eligible for anything else to come in and grow that number. By growing the number, we make the insurance or the cost of the insurance, the cost of our health program more affordable by increasing the numbers and getting closer to a, a bigger number uh, where the efficiencies, where the cost can be shared, where prices can be lower, cost can be lower to the state. Professor Ryan. have the impression that there's a parlor game going on where Americans sit around the bar and say, what could we do now to really screw up the healthcare system? <laughs> that one was one of the prize winners. Why is that so? <laughs> if you have community rating, that means everyone pays the same rate, healthy or sick. And guaranteed issue, that means every time I walk in the door of an insurance company, they must write a policy for me at those rates and on top of it, make health insurance voluntary. You set up a dynamic, you don't have to be an economist to believe this, this really happens. You look at the rates, you, you inexorably drive the healthy people out of that pool, and in the end you just have a pool with sick people. It might be much better, I think, not to have community rating, not, and, and even not have guaranteed issue. But then to, to have a discussion with God of what you would do about your sick brothers and sisters who can't get insurance at rates they could afford with their income. And so Americans always try to avoid that conversation with God by doing stupid things like community rating and guaranteed issue and then look at God and say, aren't we good people? You're not. <laughs> this is what messes up. New Jersey's uh, individual health insurance market. You, this, it's the same as Fannie Mae. It's always this half-hearted market, half-hearted regulation, and you get the worst of both worlds. And that is what's, what is frustrating to anyone coming in from the outside who watches this. The intentions are good, but my God, the policies are stupid. So you're saying, <laughs> so you're saying that uh, the road, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, is what you're saying, Doctor. Uh, well, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting discussion, and, and I think that, you know, we had, just to talk about guarantee issue for a moment, uh, there was a piece of legislation introduced by Assemblyman from uh, North Jersey uh, who wanted uh, New Jerseyans to be able to purchase insurance from other states and, you know, be able to join together with other states and purchase, and uh, whether it's as a business, uh, small business owner or as an individual. Uh, and he said that, well, you know, we could reduce the costs anywhere between, I don't know, the number of five, 20 percent, 30 percent, and if you were to purchase, be able to purchase uh, in Nevada or another state. Uh, our concern, at least, and, you know, you're the expert, uh, but, you know, our, our concern was that uh, there are states that don't have guarantee issue, and but what would the, what would the selection process be like for someone who Maybe I should wait for you to speak so I can answer the question. But uh, you know, what would it cost someone who is you know, is a, is an insurance company obligated, at, without guarantee issue, to take all comers? So someone who is of childbearing years, someone who may be sick, someone who may have a pre-existing condition, is going to pay a hell of a lot more than someone who is perceived to be young and healthy and low risk, uh, and therefore you know driving that person who really needs the insurance because they're high risk uh, away from the market, or at least away from that plan. Um, and so that's why we sort of we, we certainly I kind of pan the proposal because it has among the things in there weren't very appetizing. Uh, but you know the the, the the issues of market reform are, are pretty daunting for us as a state, and you know it's in some it's on, in some ways a national solution. Yeah, we got away from pure community rating in the individual market now, and it's now age rated. Didn't gender rate because I didn't want my entire staff to shoot me. Uh, but uh, it just which also wouldn't be fair. Uh, but the age rating at least will theoretically drive costs a little bit higher for older New Jerseyans and lower costs uh, for younger New Jerseyans and there's a way to sort of provide some sort of balance and, and get those young lives in. You get enough of the young lives in, it'll offset the cost for the older New Jerseyans who are paying a little bit more, maybe suppress their cost. And then in the end, the theory goes, everyone is, you know, happier uh, 
in that, in, at least in that individual market. Well, first, I want to start by thanking you for saying the things that you're right that um, I was reluctant to say because, again, I appreciate having a seat at the table. And so, um, <laughs> I think you want to be back. <laughs> and had I um, suggested, <laughs> and, but being more serious, that we really did a couple years ago sit down at BIA and trying to figure out um, what reforms we were going to be advocating for um, in the regulated health insurance market. And the discussion that we had around guarantee issue um, was one that politically we just didn't think that, certainly that the idea would, would never move through the legislature, but that also might get us thrown out of the room for making the suggestion. And also quite practically for some um, of the folks that have been working on these issues for a long time who had the pre-92 experience, that there were small businesses in certain industries that were sort of redlined and couldn't obtain coverage and that of trying to look at what was in the best interest of our broad membership, that there were some concerns there. But rather that we were gonna focus on a discussion around community rating, and particularly in the individual market. Um, you know, I, perhaps I wasn't at BIA or at lobbying at the time when the 92 reforms went through. Um, and I think that perhaps people weren't as focused on the individual market as perhaps that now with our sort of new economy, with more folks, you know, starting businesses, working as consultants, there's, um, a renewed interest in ensuring that the individual market truly functions because you know I get calls from people who want to go out and start a business or they have but their spouse who is the one who is right now getting the health insurance for the family wants to be able to make a change in their career and can't because that's how the family is able to sort of afford to have their health benefits that the individual market in New Jersey just didn't provide reasonable options for folks so then unless you were sort of, um, I think, you know, the last time Joel Cantor had looked at the numbers, it was sort of um, priced for someone in their mid-50s. Um, so unless you were sort of older and thought that you were likely to experience significant health care costs, it just didn't make sense for a lot of people to purchase in that market. And so that's why we did have those discussions. Um, I didn't necessarily think moving to a 5 to 1 rate band was such a good idea, although the senator did not share my view. Um, but I was pleased to see that New Jersey at least did make a change. Um, the basic and essential plan in New Jersey, there, um, a few years back, there was a basic and essential plan adopted in the individual market that did have, does have three and a half to one rating. And what we found once the carriers, once the carriers um, added some riders so that that became more than sort of a real bare bones plan, but sort of a real, just a basic health plan, it sold, and it sold significantly to younger New Jerseyans who otherwise weren't willing to spend a thousand dollars a month to buy health insurance, but would pay two hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars to buy health insurance. So I think that that experience in New Jersey showed that there was an interest in an appetite for an affordable health insurance product for individuals, and that um, I think we view the changes that were made in the most recent legislation as the beginning of a process that needs to continue that um, though well-intentioned when set up with standard plans and community rating, that um, New Jersey's regulated health insurance market, it didn't work the way we had hoped. And we need to continue to sort of revisit um, those decisions that were made and incrementally continue to change because it is about ensuring access and affordability. And right now, I don't think that those markets really are meeting the demands of the consumers and the employers in New Jersey. To sort of dovetail in the individual market to discuss this a little bit further, uh, you know, we know that, I mean, there are 80,000 lives in the individual market, those who are not eligible for small group coverage, so employees and one person, you know, an entrepreneur, a business owner who's in the individual market. There are about 80,000 members, and it breaks down to two different groups. The 60,000 are in what we call the traditional plan, that expensive plan, $12,000 a year for family coverage or more. Uh, and then there are 20,000 that are in this basic and essential policy in the individual market with B&E. And insurance companies are selling that as, and you can write her up, you can write her down, and you can get a, you can write her up rather, and you can get a basic policy and write her as you need it, and so the costs are much more affordable, and so you're getting it. That's where the market's growing. It's, the only place the individual market is growing is in the basic and essential uh, section. The, the 60,000 where the traditional plan, they're losing thousands of members every year. And it's in a death spiral, it's going to die, and uh, you can't, spread the risk with 60,000 lives who are generally older, uh, sicker, uh, and the cost is just, it's, all, it's a little bit like having 60,000 18-year-olds driving Ferraris and expecting to have 
low auto insurance rates. It, it just it, it can't happen. And while it's not that dramatic, you're only you can't spread the risk over, it and you don't understand it. You don't have to be you know an economist and anywhere near that to understand that you just can't spread that risk. Uh, and so why it's important that over time, when our new plan, our new policy, this new a vision for New Jersey takes seed, we hope, that those 60,000 New Jerseyans who are currently in the individual market will find that generally uh, it's more cost effective to be into this plan and just that will sort of be absorbed by uh, the new uh, the new policy and system. Uh, you know, we're not going to kill that market. It will die. It's, it's dying already. And so it is that we're hoping they'll come over and they will come over because of cost and the benefit design is good. And they'll come into this and we'll have even a larger group of individuals who, are, who would be covered under the new state back plan. Good morning. Um, I'm a regional health care attorney for legal services. And to access my services, a client needs to be below 200% of federal poverty level. So I'm dealing daily with the indigent. And uh, I'd like you to comment on one of the issues I was discussing with Ms. Stearns um, before the conference. There are two issues that I see daily, and we're talking about expanding coverage to other people. The two issues that I see constantly are uh, with respect to charity care and encouragement of people to bill outside of charity care so that people who actually receive charity care that you get tens of thousands of dollars worth of bills for people who are said to be not on staff at the hospitals. And, uh, and the other issue is when we expand the care, we find that there are no physicians to access. And so if we're expanding, we need to assure that there are actually physicians in that plan, otherwise it's an empty plan. So I'd like your thoughts. Well, I'll do the last part first, and I'll just turn it over to my friends. Uh, workforce is an issue, and we had currently un undertaken a workforce development initiative to try to, you know, build the family practice, medicine practice program in New Jersey more than it is today, and, and more so nurse practitioners and nurses, uh, et cetera. But uh, one of the reasons why we have, in, the, in this second phase of our reform, is what we call commercial-grade policy. It's not a Medicaid-like product. And the benefit design is very generous. It's, it's a lot like family care. It offers what you'd expect. Uh, but it's a commercial reimbursement. And early on, we said that there's no way that we can design reform and have it look like Medicaid. Medicaid in New Jersey is woefully inadequate. The reimbursement is probably the lowest, if not near to the lowest, in the nation. And so to expect the physicians, right, physicians or hospitals to be excited about this, or physicians to actually take new patients because they have this Medicaid card is really false hope because the network really doesn't exist uh, to the extent that it could serve five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand people. So it's a commercial reimbursement, which means that it's, it's modeled after the most uh, popular plan in the small employer market, uh, and it will provide the kind of reimbursement that doctors can appreciate. They would want more, of course, like they would be expected to want more, and hospitals will get reimbursed at a rate that's commercial grade, which is what they get today under a good HMO. So they'll have that access. And so when you have the card, you'll have the network, and you'll be able to gain that kind of access. Uh, we'll probably face the issues, some of the issues that Massachusetts faces in terms of primary care physicians. Uh, we're trying to address that as well, sort of on a parallel track uh, to incent more folks to go into uh, that, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of medicine. But you know, giving people commercial uh, great policy, giving them access to a network of physicians and hospitals uh, is a, you know, heck of a lot better than having a Medicaid-like product, and which is what we decided very early on that we would not do, uh, so that people could at least have some hope that they could access. Well, what I, I'll go after, because I am obviously less familiar with the population that you deal with regularly, I, I hear more from, well, from our members, our, usually our small business members talk about straight about their health insurance premiums, that that's where their concerns are. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Right, sorry. Okay. Take it out of the thing. Hold it. Hold on. Here. Let me hold it a little closer. How's that? Okay. Um, I hear regularly, though, from um, the actually usually the labor funds, the unions, who um, are dealing with these problems on a day-to-day -day basis with out-of-network providers in in-network hospitals 
because then even whether you're an HMO patient, um, the Department of Banking and Insurance requires the carriers to protect the member and to so pay the claim, and usually it ends up being charges. And if you are um, a self-funded ERISA plan, you're, again, not obligated, but they feel that they have a certain obligation to their member to also pay that claim. Sometimes they're able to negotiate a discount, sometimes not. Um, but that is a growing problem. I'm not sure quite how we address it, and it's something that we're looking at. Um, and again, for folks to understand this, this may be um, you go in for a pre-approved um, procedure, um, you have an in-network physician that you're going into an in-network hospital, but the anesthesiologist is out of network. So you may get billed charges for that. And how do we try to address those kinds of problems in the system? Because that is part of, or I call it a system, but in fact, you know, we probably don't have a healthcare system. Um, th those are growing problems that we're seeing that don't necessarily have simple solutions. Um, obviously, with our, my viewpoint from the business community, we don't look to require people to contract. But on the other hand, how do you ensure that as we put more of a burden on the healthcare consumer to understand um, and have more responsibility as they negotiate through the healthcare system, we need to ensure that they have the information that they need to know when they're sort of decision points. Um, so I don't have a solution for that. There is, I believe, I believe Senator Vitale, I think it's in front of your committee, that Senator Rice has a, ba a bill that would prohibit the balance billing. If you're an HMO patient, you should only be responsible for your copay. Um, we're seeing some medical providers that then balance bill the difference between what their the copay, what they receive um, based on the contract with the health insurance carrier, and they may try to bill the consumer for the balance. Um, so these are some of the issues that we're looking at and, and seeing out there. I, I think you touched on two things. One, for the folks you're dealing with um, who hopefully are signed up for, for Medicaid or family care, um, there's the question of network adequacy. And what we hear a lot about is are the, are the networks adequate enough and can you find, you know, it's very difficult to find a dentist um, who will take a Medicaid patient. Um, we, and, and as the folks have said, we, we have the lowest Medicaid rates. We just last year actually increased pediatric Medicaid rates, which we hoped was going to bring in some more providers, but um, I mean, we didn't have enough money to really re increase rates across the board. So you've got the question of network adequacy, and when, when you, even though you've, so you're, you've got a Medicaid managed care um, card, but can you really see a doctor? Um, but I think uh, the second question you, rate, uh, you raised that related to charity care, people below 200 percent of poverty. Um, should not be, you know, aren't filled by hospitals because they're eligible for charity care. And then the issue, then the issue is between the hospital and the state. But one thing that we actually heard about a, a number of times during on the Reinhardt Commission actually was folks above that threshold um, have the least leverage to negotiate rates with the hospital, for example. And um, um, so they often uh, may get charged a lot. And so just this summer, the package, a package of bills, and I think uh, Senator Vitale, you were one of the sponsors that Governor Corzine signed into law um, provides a caps the amount that uninsured people can be charged by a hospital. And we think that was an exciting um, reform. Um, that was actually something that Professor Reinhardt really pushed on the commission. So uh, because we really did hear a lot of testimony that the uninsured have the least leverage, you know, the one person to negotiate a rate. So um, we believe we now have some protections um, for the uninsured above that threshold. At least two of you talked about the need for managing costs. Let me ask, uh, who's supposed to manage costs? And to the two state people, you know costs are rising faster than tax revenue and you want to cover 1.3 million, million more people. How is it going to be sustainable if you don't manage costs? And I want to ask Ms. Stearns, business collectively is the largest purchaser of health insurance, yet all business has come up with to control costs is to shift costs to the workers with higher out-of-pocket costs. Why isn't business collectively saying to the insurers and the third-party administrators, we want an efficient network, we want to pay for cost-effective treatments, and we don't want to pay for treatments that are not cost-effective? Why isn't business demanding that, that care be efficient? You know, I, I, I think that's 
that's probably the pink elephant in the middle of the room, managing costs. And everyone agrees we need to manage costs. And then the problem is, how do we do it? And I talked earlier about how do you build a coalition for reform? And w when you get into the details of managing costs, it's when those coalitions fall apart. Um, because somebody's ox is gored um, uh, when you talk about that. So we all agree, for example, let's take, for example, um, chronic disease management. We all agree in theory that that's, that's something we need to look at. And I think we all agree that that's about improving the care provided and we get better um, health outcomes. But often that means, um, but you know, that are, are you going to be limiting access to care in any way? I mean, that's, that's what. Um, that's what managing costs really means, is probably limiting access to care in some ways. Um, and, and some provider um, is, is going to get squeezed. So I think it's really hard. I mean, I think that's what we find. That's, that was um, what Massachusetts was perhaps lacking in and what they're, now, um, you know, what they're now dealing with, which is their costs going up so much and not building in enough cost controls. But I've been, you know, I, I joked earlier, but Senator Vitale and I've been to enough, enough of these conferences where we often hear from folks in other states you can't do reform without controlling costs, but once you control costs, you can't do reform. You know, that's the catch-22 um, that you start to, um, and you know, one thing we haven't even talked about is long-term care. Long-term care is now the, 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 the fastest growing part of the Medicaid budget, and we're struggling with, with um, how do you handle um, long-term care costs? And, and one idea might be to go to a managed care, but we're already hearing from providers really concerned about going there. So. Um, you know, you raised a great question. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. I mean, I, I, but it's it's definitely the the issue that that holds us up. I don't, maybe Senator Vitale has the answer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have the answer, but I know that uh, we had talked about this during the course of our, our our all of our meetings over the past two years. There's also cost containment. I mean, how do you squeeze out all the unnecessary cost and waste in the system? Uh, and that's a fairly daunting uh, mission uh, because there are a number of things that you would probably have to do. Uh, some aren't politically possible, some are, and some will take time to sort of evolve, and this is sort of an evolutionary uh, undertaking that we're all participating in. Uh, I do know that in the new plan, which is you know, self-funded and backed by the state, uh, that we're going to try to wring out a lot of the administrative costs in the new plan, so at least try to minimize that. But in terms of disease management, in terms of you know, chronic uh, diseases and uh, trying to um, you know, create a healthier uh, population, that's going to take a lot of time. Those are generational changes. Those are our cultural changes. Uh, and we need to address them sort of in, in a way that's parallel. But those, identifying those items and addressing them in a way that makes sense in terms of their solutions is, I think, a little bit more difficult than you know, the underlying initiative for reform. But it's something that has to be considered, of course. And that just, and actually, you know, I should have said earlier that I think this, this is an example of why we need um, a federal answer. Um, uh, from this, for the simple reason that the federal government can deficit spend and states cannot, right? And so we've got, so every time we look at a chronic disease program, if we can't show cost savings within that year, within that budget year, um, it's very hard to invest money. It's hard to invest money in IT improvements uh, on the state budget calendar, and the federal government just has more flexibility and can invest more, and it's going to require upfront investments that states really just don't have the, the funds to do. I'm just going to quickly address, if I may, the, the question, because it's a good question that you asked. But first, I, I do want to sort of challenge um, your assumption, which is that, that all employers are doing is sort of passing the cost on to their employees, just in defense of the large employers. Most, okay. <laughs> that, that, um, but as a percentage of the total cost, it has actually been relatively stable, the piece that they've asked the employees to pick up. And when you look at the small employers in New Jersey, they actually tend to pay 100% of the premium. So not to say that they haven't, in trying to keep those costs down, looked to purchase plans that have higher co-pays and, you know, that that isn't certainly part of the mix, but that, you know, employers sometimes get a bad rap of saying they just sort of pass those cost increases on to their employees. I'm not really sure that they do. And at the end of the day, you also have to look at, well, what is the total weight, you know, package that you're receiving in terms of your benefits? Your cost shift is from premium share, which has been fairly stable. Mm -hmm. Cost shift is from design changes. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I understand that that's part of it. And then getting to sort of the, the meat of your question, which really had to do with then why aren't we pushing more? I would say for particularly the smaller employers, they really don't have a lot of leverage and they don't really know what the answer is. They, they may know and agree that increasing quality and having um, incentives for people to get the care early, you know, the wellness programs, the disease management programs, um, 
but some of those, I think, are issues that relate to also the way insurance is regulated and what we require to pay. And in it, it's a matter of then figuring out, well, how do we try to allow for um, more creative incentives and compensation for physicians that, you know, puts the emphasis on the treatment early, that rewards managing the case and, you know, helping someone manage their asthma so that they don't end up in the emergency room. So I think that we do need to do more in that direction. Um, although in the past, sometimes those efforts have been resisted by the medical community. And so I think also it's a matter of also sort of bringing all the stakeholders along. Otherwise, what we tend to see is, or I tend to see, is legislation then that, you know, eliminates the use, that bans the use of referrals in health insurance in New Jersey, which is a bill that's up on Monday in the assembly, or that requires any willing provider to be part of the network, again, you know, not allowing a plan to sort of direct the members of that plan to a particular, you know, lab that they think has the quality and the better price. So it's complicated. Uh, I certainly am encouraged by the steps that are being taken to get children insured and families. But every time a hospital closes in New Jersey, and we've had more than 75 hospitals closing, I guess, in the last 10 years, access and availability of health care diminishes. It seems to me that there should be more encouragement of co uh, hospitals working together cooperatively rather than competing. And every time they compete, they're getting new equipment, they're raising prices, and they're closing their doors. So it seems to me that that should be one of the key things in discussing access to health care. Thank you. Um, and, and you may check in, Dr. Reinhardt, if you want, if there are others. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right. We've had um, eight hospitals close over just the last 18 months, and, um, and one just within the last couple of weeks, actually. So we definitely, you know, one thing that was clear, and the reason we, we created the Reinhardt Commission was that there's tremendous distress in the system. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I might disagree a little bit on the sense that, um, you know, that the hospitals are competing. And actually, what, you know, what we've, what we've found is that the Reinhardt Commission was very clear that we had excess capacity. And that excess capacity, too many hospital beds in certain parts of the state, was actually what, one of the real drains and one of the causes of hospital distress. And what we've seen in a couple of the regions now where hospitals have closed is that it's strengthened the other hospitals, which is good for the system. And I think um, in the long run, um, that's better for patients. Um, I think also it's clear um, from a quality perspective that volume equals quality. And so to the extent that, we, you know, that we're developing more centers of excellence, um, that's better for the patient. Of course, it, we, it's critical that we preserve access to services. And that's been what's gu been guiding us at the Department of Health. Um, but I think what we're seeing is now in the 21st century, there are different ways to meet the needs of patients. People are spending, um, average hospital stays are going down. People are having fewer surgical interventions and more medical interventions. And so what we need to do is we need to expand um, the different options for patients. I think what we're seeing now is the strengthening of our cl neighborhood clinics. We're seeing a new model of a satellite emergency department and a medical mall behind it, a hospital will close and it'll be converted to doctor's offices and an emergency department. We're seeing new ways to meet the needs, the needs of patients. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna say it's perfect, but it's clear from the Reinhardt Commission that we, were, we had too many beds and that was one of the causes of overutilization that was weakening the system and, and not leading to better quality of care for patients. So I think you're right that the challenge for us is how do we deal with this hospital distress and preserve access to services, but I think the lesson we've learned is that it's not always an acute care hospital that meets the needs of that community. We have a lot of questions popping up. So yeah, I'm just going to we'll, real quick. Uh, okay. Just I wanted to address the issue of charity care and also the hospital issue. And, you know, I think it's obviously important that hospitals compete uh, for for patients, for technology, for services, uh, and, and sometimes that can be healthy, and most times it can be healthy. Sometimes it's not. I mean, tradition. I mean, one example is. And fortunately, this relationship is vastly improved. There was this, you know, real tug of war between Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick and St. Peter's uh, some years ago, where they were really wanting to grab all the market share of that entire area. And they all have a very now very specialized, and very important role to play in that region, Middlesex County and, and Somerset County and beyond. Uh, and so that's it's a good thing to have that kind of competition. But you know, we look at some have said that we should look at hospitals. Uh, 
at least hospital services on a regional basis. They really, what's necessary? I know part of the Reinhardt report described, you know, what are essential hospitals, and uh, and that was it was very helpful. Uh, you know, in the end, we we will spend, and since I've been in the legislature nearly 11 years, several billion dollars reimbursing hospitals for care they've provided uh, to the uninsured and the undocumented, and. Just this year, it's over $600 million. Last year was more than that. Year before that is about the same number. And the march goes on and on and on. And it's just money, you know, it's good money after bad. Each and every year, we have this debate, we have this fight in Trenton about, uh, about charity care and hospitals are in distress. And, uh, and it's a very valid argument. Uh, but the solution is not to continue to pour money into hospitals. The solution is to provide uh, access to health care for those who are uninsured. If, you know, 96 percent of every charity care dollar the state gives back to hospitals uh, is spent on people who live at or below 200 percent of poverty. And I've used this all the time, and I'll probably get a copyright letter, is that you don't have to be Dr. Reinhardt to figure out that, and, and I mean, which is a good thing, it's a compliment that you, you know, if we ensure the folks who are at 200 percent of poverty or below, that the majority of the, of the charity care uh, load that's now being consumed by hospitals uh, or burdened or uh, uh, taken by hospitals is going to drop dramatically. They also eat another one one point three billion dollars in bad debt. You know, the six hundred and some odd million dollars we're going to get to the hospitals this year is only a percentage. It's a good percentage, but it's only uh, maybe sixty percent of the entire burden that they see uh, from the charity care eligibles. And then there are those who are not eligible for charity care, and there's another billion dollars in bad debt there that they eat for folks who aren't charity care eligible but walk into the hospital without insurance and need to get the care. So when we talk about hospitals closing, like maybe Muhlenberg is not a great example, but there are others where that disproportionate burden of charity care, the undocumented, uh, has really hurt those hospitals, and which is why reform is necessary also. Yeah, um, I'm Laura Kahn. I'm a member of the Governing Council of the New Jersey Chapter of the American College of Physicians. The American College of Physicians represents all of the physicians for adults, including general internists, cardiologists, gastroenterologists, uh, rheumatologists, et cetera. Now, you talk about wanting to have universal access to, to care, and I'm asking wh exactly what kind of care are you talking about? Because if you're talking about primary care, well, primary care is dying. Uh, I heard from my colleagues the other night that uh, last year, 3% of the 3% of medical students chose to go into general internal medicine. That number is just plummeting, um, and uh, very few people are choosing to go into the cognitive fields, the non the non um, procedural fields. So, if you want quality care. Uh, for the uninsured, you need to make sure that the um, incentives are there for medical students to pursue this kind of work. Um, I'm sure if you want access to Botox, there will be no problem in getting universal access for that. But universal access to prevent, uh, you know, to treat hypertension, diabetes, asthma, very hard to get physicians now to go into that line of work. Well, the good news is that under the new plan, we're not going to cover Botox. We are, um, uh, but you raise a good point, and it's something that someone had raised earlier about the workforce development initiative issues. And I went to, uh, I, I spoke uh, to a group of medical students at Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine, and uh, there were maybe around 100 in the audience. And at the end, I asked how many were going to go into family medicine, and one person raised their hand, and I asked who are going to go into other, other fields and, uh, and other disciplines, and so many more raise their hands, and, uh, which is why you know, we're working with Dr. Al Talley and some others at the Robert Johnson School, or rather at, uh, at the medical school, uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the uh, family care program, family medicine program. Yeah, this is also an issue that you know, falls on your organization and others, that you yeah, really have to come to the state with some solutions. Do we do tuition forgiveness? Do we build a program like we did in the, under Governor Kane, for example, when we had a teacher shortage? Uh, we guaranteed you know, tuition repayment if after graduation you practiced or you taught in an inner city or an underserved area. I mean, is that the kind of incentive we need to provide to some medical students? Uh, do the schools themselves have to provide more leadership in this regard as well? It can't just be a legislator saying, well, I've got a magic idea, or you must do this. Something I can't do, but uh, the community, the medical community, really has to step up and, and say to themselves and to the, to the brethren, to those who are, you know, part of the old establishment, the medical society, 
you know, old stodgy white uh, doctors that, you know, specialties aren't everything. Uh, cardiology, oncology, all those great things that we need to have people trained in are great, but we also need family practice. We need, med we need the day-to-day -day doc uh, out there doing what he does and what she does. You know, and I think, I, I think just to dovetail on that, that we need to put our money where our mouth is and we need to value those, um, we need to value primary care and, and that's in reimbursement rates. Um, and, then, and then that will probably, um, you know, change the, the, that dynamic that you'll find when you visit a medical school class. So we're going to continue this dialogue till about 10 after, uh, and then uh, I think we will take a 15-minute break, 10 or 15-minute break. Uh, so if people can uh, hold on until then, and then make sure to be back at the 10:30 for our uh, second distinguished panel. Rich, along with what the woman to my right just said, how do we address the deteriorating quality of healthcare provision and the dilution of the qualifications for providing care on this road to increased access? I'll just chime in that um, on the first point, I, I think my, I, I certainly agree that we need enough more primary care physicians and being the business community, I guess my solution is we should pay you more and that that might help. Um, and that on just generally on quality, I, I certainly am not, don't have a clinical background, um, but I think that our view at BIA has been, you know, health IT and that we really need um, to pursue that 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 probably is um, a clear path to increasing the quality of the care um, that residents of New Jersey receive. I mean, we certainly need the providers there, but having that that seems to be the clear way to help increase quality. I'm less clear about what you mean by qualification. I mean, I would assume they're all still licensed. <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily think it's a bad thing that part of, I'm sorry, that part of primary care is not just physicians that we're finding roles for nurses and physicians assistants. I just think that it needs to be an appropriately fully integrated um, system. I asked the doctor. Well, actually, I think you gave an excellent, uh, an excellent answer. It, it is the case that the uh, spectrum of health care providers has increased and that uh, many more professions are involved in providing care. <clears throat> that uh, ideally should be well articulated and vertically integrated so that people should be doing work that they're uh, trained for and are appropriately supervised. I, I would say that the average physician uh, coming out of training now is probably better trained uh, and better monitored and more likely to continue with continuing medical education and continuing certification than at any time in the past. We've been told, we've been informed that uh, the lion's share of uh, expenses are going to the uh, upper age bracket, those who are the closest to being uh, planted uh, underneath the sod. Uh, question. Is there any consideration being given to the concept of rationing or of a cap on the amount of expenses being spent uh, for, uh, for the continuation of uh, another month, another week, or what have you, of life, where we, we so desperately need uh, uh, these monies for, uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the younger population? I, I think that's an a, that's a excellent question. No, I don't think there's discussion of rationing, but there is, uh, you may be familiar with the Dartmouth Atlas study, which showed that um, New Jersey was, was uh, among the worst in the nation in terms of how much we spend on, the last, on a patient's last six months of life under Medicare. And what, and what they found was that we're subjecting patients to a lot of tests and we're not getting any better outcomes for it. And of course, that's a great concern. Um, I, I think what we need to do a better, jo a better job of in this state is um, letting patients know about their options. We have a very underdeveloped um, hospice system here in New Jersey as compared to other states. Um, and, and as I've tried to figure out why that is, there are a number of reasons. But um, you look at some of the western states and they have much more developed. 
um, uh, you know, alternative systems um, than we do. So that's one thing to look at. It's clear that we are spending um, a, a lot at the end of life and not necessarily getting better results for it. I don't uh, think that, you know, to have the, the rationing discussion would be, I don't know if it's the right discussion to even have. Uh, you know, those who are uh, uh, near the end of life, uh, who want the services, who need the service to sustain, however, however long it is that they're going to live, should get access to that care. Now, to have the, for the moral discussion as a family, uh, should we continue this care, it's, it's up to that family. And I don't believe that for the sake of freeing up a few more dollars to cover some younger people, uh, at the expense of, uh, of denying services to someone who is uh, dying uh, or will die in six months or three months or two months is sort of the, the right moral decision uh, to make. Uh, the, this, there is a better system, and the Commissioner talked about hospice care, and you know, over time people understanding that they need to take care of themselves in a way that's uh, more efficient and smarter and better. Uh, but we need to make the investment in uh, in young people. We spend so much money, not just on the end of life, but on the back end of life, uh, for those who are chronically ill. We spend so much money uh, caring for people who have ne either neglected their, their health, uh, in their health care entirely, uh, or just, you know, bad things happen when you get older. Uh, but we need to get people, younger people uh, as well, at the same time, uh, engaged in their health care uh, by providing for them uh, a system that's affordable where they get that access to do to provide the kind of real prevention uh, that we need to, uh, you know, healthcare is one thing, prevention is another. Sometimes you have these separate discussions, but they're really not. They're really wedded. We want to take one more question before the I'll catch you afterwards. Ma'am? Hi. Um, I'm a physician in primary care, and my practice is doing very well. The reason is that I don't do any HMOs, I don't do any health insurance, I don't do any um, government health programs, and people pay me cash. <laughs> um, and because I don't have to hire reams of secretaries to bill all those health insurance programs, I can do it for a lot less than what um, the other doctors have to do. And many of my colleagues are going under because they can't possibly accept the low reimbursement and then hire all those people to try to fight to get paid. Um, I don't think government can do health care. The doctors in the hospitals do health care. And I, my recommendation is that um, we have uh, charity clinics where the doctors volunteer a couple hours a month. We could get the job done. We have a um, charity clinic at Zarephath where we see 200 patients a month at a low cost of about $18 per patient visit. Patients put a couple dollars in the, the, uh, the little box and the, the prices get, the, the costs get met. So I think that, um, I do really think out of the box, but just getting rid of all the bureaucracy is, is probably going to be the most cost effective way to get the job done. You and I have had this discussion about uh, your practice and so it's, it's a wonderful undertaking. I just don't believe that we can duplicate that, uh, not just in New Jersey but around the nation to depend on, rely on the benevolence of physicians and nurse practitioners uh, to do this work for free or to you know, throw some money in a, in a bucket and I don't need to you know, minimize what you're doing because I know it's much more complicated than that. Uh, we have to do all those things. We have clinics. We have, you know, we have Catholic charities. We have organizations that, uh, that struggle every day to just open the door and provide care to people who need it. And those, those are wonderful organizations who should always be sustained and we should do all we can to help them. Uh, I don't know that that system actually works sort of globally or even at a, at a statewide level uh, to just sort of rely on the benevolence of doctors to sort of come together to provide that care. You do a wonderful job, and uh, we hope that that practice grows. So I, I think uh, on that note, we'll take a short break now.